Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we are quickly approaching in history the birth of our Lord, um, but not quite yet. Uh, we've just talked about the Battle of Actium, I believe, last time. Mm-hmm. And so this time we need to talk a little bit more, well, we need to do a little more scene setting yeah. Um, and talk about the, the different philosophies that are sweeping the world at this point or have firmly found footholds in the world, um, depending. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there, there are mainly four, yes? Yeah, at this point, the history books sum up four uh, formal philosophical schools. They have their roots uh, as far back as Alexander. So they follow hard after uh, Aristotle's passing and all that. But with the great, huge, giant philosophers out of the way, some not so well-known, not so impressive philosophers appear, each with their take on something. And in many ways, the catalyst was Alexander, because Plato and Aristotle and Socrates assumed the supremacy of the polis, the local city-state. Alexander just created a world polis, a cosmopolis, Mm -hmm. cosmopolitan empire. So where exactly are our absolutes and our standards coming from? Can I really will and choose the same thing as that Persian guy and that Egyptian guy and that Jewish guy? And is there a framework for for law and and, and meaning in all of this? And and so we get four different answers. And by and large, the answers are no. <laughs> We're, 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 we're used to the polis thing. And um, <clears throat> if that's not going to work, yeah, let's just kind of call it a day. So we start with the cynics uh, from the Greek word kino for dog, because these people thought that uh, virtue and manners were highly overrated <laughs> uh, and just wandering around out in the open our, our our homeless friends could take a lesson here. They could live without shame because that's kind of what some of these cynics did. Just the without shame is the point and why they were called the school of the dog. Just as dogs do all kinds, perform all kinds of biological, biological functions out in the world without any shame, they felt, why not? Why, why should anything him a sin? The only thing that really matters is self-sufficiency. And on the one hand, yes, being a multi-billionaire might qualify. <laughs> it's probably easier to be self-sufficient by not needing things or people or places or much of anything. Uh, the, um, the most famous of the cynics was a man named Diogenes, who lived at the time of Alexander. He was known for um, criticizing everything. Uh, turning his nose up at everything, uh, deliberately being adopting an insulting lifestyle and not caring. He lived in a barrel down by the beach and uh, became famous for all of this somehow. A lot of this reminds me of the hermits of the medieval period. That is a good observation. Yeah, you're right. The same sort of thing. They're recognized as holy men because... What? <laughs> because somehow they don't need anything, and yeah. so they are keeping themselves from anything that could taint them, I guess. I guess so. You, you need, there has to be a worldview in place already. Uh, but once it's there, um, and, and the Middle Ages was certainly permeated with a platonic worldview at times, once it's there, sure, I don't need the world, I just need... But the thing is, the cynics really weren't even looking for for truth. They were not sure there was much of anything to really pursue. Th- these philosophies tend to have an ethical bit, except their ethics end up in, and we should, how should we then live? Why do we care? Um, we should live like we don't care, is kind of, is kind of the answer they come down to. Um, Alexander came to visit um, Diogenes and ask, is there anything I can do for you? And Diogenes uh, said, yeah, stand a little to the left. You're blocking my sunlight. Not the kind of thing you normally should say to the conqueror of the world. 
And uh, But uh, Alexander was so impressed with his gutsiness, he said, if I could be any man in the world but Alexander, I would be Diogenes. And Diogenes replied, if I could be any man in the world but, by, but Diogenes, I would be anybody but Alexander. <laughs> you got away with I it. I respect it. <laughs> <laughs> so those, those are the cynics. Notice there's not a whole lot about... Uh, dialectics and form and ideals that it's just how are you going to live and do you actually have a reason for it well the reason seems to be there's no reason not to there's no appeal to some higher absolute or principle or the voice of a god or a voice in your head it's just isn't it obvious you want to be happy don't be bound down by things which brings us to the epicureans who were Similar in some ways, you know, their solutions were very similar. Uh, when Paul was on Mars Hill, Acts 17, he encountered both Epicureans and Stoics, and the Stoics will be the next group. The Epicureans taught that pleasure is the highest good and the proper goal of life, but by pleasure, today the word Epicurean in English means someone who enjoys the finest wines, the finest steaks, the finest French fruit, and all that. It's not what that wasn't what they they meant. Uh, they realized that to become dependent upon food or drink or sex or drugs or anything like that is actually rather enslaving and makes for not peace because you're always struggling to meet your addiction or live up to your food bill. Uh, and, and so their take on it was, we want serenity. We don't want things to hurt us or trouble us. Uh, so the fewest connections... The simpler foods, the things that are not addictive, uh, superficial relationships, that makes for a happy, contented life because there are we're removing the inward and outward stresses. That's what it's all about. It seems As like for, satisfaction might be a better word than pleasure because it's not yeah. thrill-seeking. No, it's absolutely not thrill-seeking. Yeah. It's, well, serenity, peace. Mm -hmm. Don't, I, 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 I'm okay. You're not bothering me. So <laughs> that's all we really need here, isn't it? They did have some words about the gods. They did not deny that the gods, the traditional pagan gods, or something like them might exist. But they said, you know, if they're gods, we don't care about us. We don't care about ants. <laughs> we don't check in on the ants and see if they're obeying our rules or anything. We just kind of stomp on them occasionally or just leave them alone. That's how the gods would be with us if they're real. They don't care about us. So... No particular reason we should care about them or expect anything from them. Why would they help us? So we'll 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 just leave. If you want to be, if you want to believe in gods or if you want to be in anything, it doesn't matter because it comes down to the same thing. They are transcendent. We're on our own. So just make it through life with getting to, without getting too involved in anything, either socially, personally, physically. Uh, nutritionally, uh, aesthetically, <laughs> whatever, and 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 that's that's the happy life. Um, that brings us to the Stoics, who Paul also encountered on Mars Hill. They they at least tried for something. Uh, echoing Heraclitus, they said the universe reality is living rational fire. We would say, I suppose, energy, some kind of energy field that comes and goes, is in and out, is kindling and, 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 and dying out. It's in perpetual motion. But within it is a law or reason, and they use the word logos, mm -hmm. uh, the same word John uses of Jesus, but they meant something different. Uh, and John knew that. And John knew that. So when John writes his gospel, says, Logos, y'all know about the Logos? You're so completely wrong about it. Let me tell you about the Logos. <laughs> because for them, for the Stoics, the Logos was identical more or less with reality, or at least it was the, the reason or mind imminent within the, the energetic universe. Um, the force from Star Wars is as close as analogies I can come up with in modern times. I suppose pantheism of, of various forms partakes of it, uh, except that here there was more of a belief that there was a rationality. Uh, Hinduism really doesn't do that. Uh, how, force, the force comes closer, actually. How does this differ um, or 
does it from the Gnostic idea of the the central flame sort of being reflected out um, into lesser spheres? Uh, in this way, as I would understand it, the Gnostics uh, see something, as it were, behind the scenes or above the scenes, something removed from mundane reality. Whereas the Stoics would say, no, it's the, the, this energy you're describing, that's us. Mm. It, it's Take the, the materialist viewpoint of matter in motion, but think energy in motion. Mm. Um, that's all the universe is. We see it as other things. In that sense, it's you, you can think of pantheism. But again, the Stoics were looking for some kind of divine reason in all this. And it's divine. But so is man, because man's part of all. We all share the divinity, and we all share the rationality, and man can know because he's sharing the same mind as God. That's how man knows, and that's how man discovers law. Law, there, there, there's, there's one law for the empire because there's one law for the universe. And all rational men participate in it by being men. And we just have to do a little soul-searching uh, a little rational thinking that is tap the universe and imitate it. And then we can know and we can make rules that apply at our level of awareness. Uh, so unlike the Gnostics who would seek to leave this world behind, they would mm -hmm. say, well, we're already God. God is in us, we're in God, and we just need to do a better job of acting that way down on our level where where we are aware of things, as far as I can understand what they're saying. So less of an anti-material flavor. Yeah, I, I think so. Okay. Um, now, when Paul was um, was confronting these two groups on Mars Hill, if you remember his his sermon outline, on the one hand, he is at pains to say that we that, that God is Im imminent in Him we live and move and have our being, and he actually quotes Stoic poets. In fact, mm -hmm. that is a quote from the Stoic poets. Yeah. Uh, we are also his offspring, another quote from the Stoic poet. So he quotes them to attack the Epicurean idea that God is far off and remote. A good part of his argument is that. But then he has to turn around and say, but God is not like, um, God is not so, is not imminent in the way that he is infused into the creation that we find him there. He is a sovereign judge who will hold us accountable one day and will judge the world by the man he's ordained because of whom he's given notice because he raised him from the dead. At that point, he's, he's offended everybody. <laughs> uh, he's attacked the uh, virtual deism, um, the, the hyper-transcendence of the Epicureans and the hyper-eminence of the Stoics. God is not the universe, and yet God cannot be shut out of the universe, and he actually is involved in this care. So th this, this is important material when you come to Acts 17, when you come to uh, the Areopagus and Paul's Sermon on Mars Hill, to understand why he's doing what he's doing. He starts out with, you guys are so superstitious, overly religious, look at all the idols. But he comes down to, you know, you Epicureans don't believe in idols. You Stoics don't believe in idols. Why are there idols all over the place? You, you are condemning yourself by, you should be the voices out there telling people to tear these things down on your own pagan premises, on your own pagan premises. You're not living up to your ethical standards, how much less by those of the true God who made heaven and earth. And um, which is why people didn't want to hear him anymore. Yeah, that's interesting, Paul. We'll go our way. Uh, their, their take on life is that man's virtue or freedom comes from apathetic acceptance of whatever life may bring. Because the universe is logical and rational, as rational as a differential equation, uh, you can't tinker with it or change it. It's set. Think of a computer program that runs the universe. Once it's there, it's there. And it's going to do what it's going to do. And we're part of that. We're zeros and ones in the uh, outplay of this program, but psh, we can't change anything. So don't try. Just accept that sometimes fate's going to be good and sometimes it's not going to be so good. And just go with the flow.
because there's nothing else you can do. And you only make life worse by complaining about it and being agitated or fearful or worrying or whatever. It is interesting that all of these words have passed into English, but they've all changed their meaning. When we say cynic today, we mean someone who doesn't believe the party line, questions everything, doesn't trust anybody's uh, information. Epicurean people who enjoy the fine things of life to the point of overindulgence. Stoics, those who show no emotion, the classic example in my generation, of course, was Mr. Spock in Star Trek. <laughs> and then, you know, and then that brings us to the last one, the skeptics. And again, the philosophers meant something not, not, they did not mean what we mean. When we say skeptical, we mean you're always, you're never believing people. You're asking for more information. You always think people are lying to you. You want a reason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the philosophers were not that. Uh, the, the more modern version is David Hume, who simply looked at reality and said, well, that's what my eyes tell me. That's what my ears, my nose tell me, my tongue tells me, but I can reach out and touch. And it all seems to be so. But given that I have the thing called the brain that's interpreting data from the outside, how do I know that any of this is real? And the classic example, I, I, not my favorite movie, but I love it because it simplifies philosophical illustrations no end. The Matrix. <laughs> how do we know we're not living in the Matrix? How do we not know that we're just part of a program? and that any of this is real. We believe what our brains tell us, but why? Mm -hmm. What's what are, what are our grounds for trusting our own senses? So this is a step beyond agnosticism in that it says not only do we not know, we cannot know. We cannot know. Yeah. Yeah, it is impossible to know. On the other hand, um our senses may be perfectly right, but we'll never know that in this world. Uh, speaking of David Hume, when the uh, the English dictionary writer Samuel Johns Johnson heard of this philosophy, that said, you know, that rock may not be real, he walked over and kicked the rock and said, ah, it's real. Which really, of course, did not solve the problem. Because the response is, well, your brain says that you felt pain, but there's no way of knowing that there's a rock out there that caused it. All you know is that you have the sensation of kicking a rock and the reciprocal perception of pain, and you don't know what's really out there. And so the skeptics, the Greek skeptics said, a wise man will simply not register an opinion here. He will remain hyper agnostic about everything. But for practical purposes, because it seems to hurt less if you believe that that, that is a cliff and I shouldn't jump off of it, <laughs> um, you'll follow local custom and law, and one assumes the basic laws of Newtonian physics don't chop off tall buildings, uh, don't run into a pack of bad dogs and things. Not because you have real doubts or real certainties about the reality, but you know that when you do that, when your brain says or your mind tells you, those are mad dogs with snarling teeth and slobbering, slobbering saliva mouths, and they're coming after me and barking. And I know by experience that if I just wait here, they're going to tear me to pieces and it's going to hurt. It may all be in my head, but the pain will be in my head, and I don't want the pain in my head. So I'm running. Uh, I will pretend that maybe it's real just to be on the safe side. Uh, so these these are the things that they, the ideas that intelligent men, if you want to call them that, people who fancy themselves wise and philosophers, these are the ideas that were popular throughout what had been Alexander's empire when Jesus came. And they caught on in, in, in the Roman Empire as well. Rome was lousy at creating philosophies. Um, <laughs> as previously discussed. <laughs> yes. Marcus Aurelius, you, you asked about before, was, was a Stoic. He didn't invent anything. And the things he says are pretty cliche. He just put them together in little couplets nicely. Uh, and so others adopted these various philosophies to one degree or another. The Stoics were the only ones who came, who really answered the question of how do we frame knowledge, reason, and law for a cosmopolitan empire? Um, and they said, because, all right, my cat wants to talk to me. <laughs> um, they said, because there is this, this cosmos, this universe, this, 
universal energy field of which we are all expressions. And so we all do have something in common, and it's not the local city-state. It's something metaphysical and behind all of this and, be, and underneath it where we can't see it, but it's real. And from it, from this reason that we all participate in that operates in us all, we can make deductions, both moral and legal, that are binding on all nations. So once again, we have a step in the direction of natural law. Um, this is not the Christian idea of general revelation, where the work of the law remains in us because we're the image of God. This is an appeal to the deification of mankind. We are part and parcel of God, so of course we're smart and know stuff, including how to frame laws for the world. Uh, these are not the same things, but Christians have had a really, really hard time disentangling them. Because the, the issue is a real one, and it's a pressing one. Mm -hmm. Rome never dealt with it, really, uh, until you get to Justinian, where he tries to take the the pragmatic Roman law and fuse it with biblical law to give it some cohesiveness. Rome basically just looked at how people did stuff and and work with that. Okay, so this nation uh, doesn't eat pork. This nation does. All right. Well, as long as you're not living each, next to each other, I don't. Get, oh, you visited their country and they offered you a sandwich and it was pork. Okay, well, you know, they didn't know, and you didn't know, so put your knives away. This is not <laughs> a... Uh, and those are the kind of things that Rome really had to deal with, because when you conquer a world where everybody has their own gods and their own ideas of morality, and some of them are rather odd and far-fetched by anybody's standards, you, you have to have some kind of system to pull it together, and Rome had been very good. They remember they they actually had an officer who was responsible for creating this universal law of nations and trying to figure out how these things would mesh because they had to administer it. it was, and, and that's, this again, very pragmatic. We need to make this work because we don't need rebellions over religious ideas. We don't need people at war with each other over religious ideas. They can practice their religions all they want as long as they're not hurting anybody or disturbing the peace of the empire or threatening our governmental system. And of course, in time, that meant threatening the emperor. Uh, and we will see as we move forward in time that the emperor for Rome becomes the focus. In him, deity is incarnate. And Rome was content to license all kinds of religions as long as you admitted that the stability, the uh, glue that held the empire together was the deity of the emperor. So, which meant that he could all, that his, the peace of the empire could always trump your religion. You want to do that? Not a problem. You want to do that? Not a problem. You want to do that? Yeah, that's going to stir up trouble. So no, but our religion demands, tough, get over it. You're not doing that because the peace of the empire comes first. And you swore that Caesar is Lord and you bowed your religion to him. So there we go. For Rome, it was a political necessity. You, you're, you're, you're trying to administer an empire of dozens and dozens of client states, conquered peoples, uh, peoples of all classes, slaves, merchants who cross the sea and have to deal with other peoples of others. You can't keep everybody locked up in their country. They're gonna, they're gonna merge and meet and interact, and your judges have to be able to sort it out. So this is the kind of world that Jesus was born into. We have this very pragmatic empire with lots of military force, working on a world that has been Hellenized. And so, although the, t technically the historians say the Hellenistic age ended with Actium, you know, ages don't end that way any more <laughs> than they are born that way. Yeah. No one walked out after the Battle of Actium and smelled the Greek air and said, I feel that the Hellenistic age is over now. I'm not sure why. Some new era is dawning. Can, I can feel the word Rome about it somehow. And it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, and we can see the lingering effects of Hellenism in the Hellenistic age, uh, I think very clearly in Pontius Pilate. He was a man of his time. And when Jesus says, I, come, I came to bear witness to the truth, we all know Pilate's response. What is truth? He was serious. He'd been, he's well-educated. He knew what the philosopher said. As far as he was concerned and as the best thinkers were concerned, there was no truth. And Jesus was being some kind of nonsensical mystic 
obviously not in touch with reality and therefore no threat to the empire because that's what we got. And so again, Paul on Mars Hill confronts Stoics and Epicureans. This, this, these ideas, these thought forms are continuing to circulate and they will until finally Christianity enters the empire in force and begins to challenge them both on an intellectual and a spiritual level. There were some other things that were grabbing the attentions of men. I have um, five. I borrowed these from uh, Michael Grant, who is the, if he's still alive, the reigning authority on classical Europe. And he's written books on the Romans and the Greeks and both of them together and has one of the best books I've seen on the Hellenistic age. Uh, and he's written, he's written about everything. He, um, he lists uh, five things beyond the philosophers that more ordinary people who weren't readers and weren't philosophers, weren't scientists, things they grabbed onto to try to make sense of their lives. Um, in, I, I don't know if this is his order, but I'll assume it probably is since I generally plagiarize in order. <laughs> um, well, yeah, assume that the author knew what he was doing. Many accepted with dismal faith the all-controlling power of arbitrary fortune. Fortune for them, and this is something we run into in Augustine's City of God, fortune is fate. It is to them the opposite of free will. Um, and, and the Stoics were sort of on that same track. The universe is set in motion, but whereas the Stoics counted on man's ability to have some kind of symbiotic knowledge in, in sync with the universe. Most people just said, you know, what will be, will be. Um, all my life is controlled by fortune and there's really, I really don't have choices. I don't have free will. I mean, you know, maybe I can choose whether I'm having hamburgers or hot dogs for lunch, but beyond that, yeah, big deal. The great, yeah, big deal. The great things of life are set in motion and there's nothing we can do. So why worry about it? Why try to change it? Just, it's coming, it's going to smack you upside the head, and if occasionally it gives you something happy, just enjoy it while you can. Uh, others, including some of the best educated, believed in astral determination. That is, they, they looked at fortune, but they said, yes, but there's a reason these things happen, and that's because our destiny is written in the stars. <laughs> Augustine and, addresses this as well. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, he does. If you haven't read uh, The City of God, the early chapters, you need to, because this is right where he's starting. Uh, you people are arguing over free will or some kind of determinism. Uh, and in astrology was a big deal. Mm -hmm. They They thought if you could look at the stars, you could forecast the movements of fate and you had enough free will to maybe make some minor adjustments uh, and escape the worst of it and maybe jump on the, uh, the bullet train of the best of it and get a little more happiness, a little more peace than you would, you would otherwise have. And thus people flocked to fortune tellers, to those who did horoscopes, which was presented as a very scientific mathematical thing. Mm -hmm. Now, this is important for as we're coming up on the Middle Ages before too long, because this is maintained in Christian civilization for a very, very long time because it was not presented as magic, but as mathematics and physics. Uh, this continued to be a thing into the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And some of the reformers, although they were hostile to any kind of magic, if they perceived it to be such, were not nearly so hostile to astrology. And it was with some effort that astrology died out and astronomy took its place. Uh, so this this is something that's going to be in the background, and we need to understand that people have not always thought as we have about the study of the stars. Now, the, ar the argument, at first glance, the argument for astrology doesn't seem that far-fetched. The sun is a heavenly body. Does the sun influence us? If it's clouded over or um, if it has set? Yeah. How about the moon? Well, women know about that one. Um, and of course, the sun and moon together, there, there's an effect on crops. And and if if the stars also have these kind of powers, then shouldn't they also be exercising some kind of influence? And of course, 
in these days, the stars were identified with particular gods and goddesses, as they sometimes are today by those who do horoscopes. So if you were born when Mars was ascended, you're going to have a warlike disposition. When Venus is ascended, you're going to be a lover, and so on. And, and I August mean, there's the, again, trying to uh, build the, how do we call the cron concrete man rather than the straw man. <laughs> um, uh, the wise men from the East, yeah. they certainly knew something from their study of the stars. Yeah, something, something was going on with the stars. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that was something that grabbed a lot of people. And then other people just flat out turned to magic. Um, as if it were another practical science. It was not, it was not the ooey, scary, weird stuff. It was, this is simply the way the universe, universe works. As above, so below. As below, so above. The universe is synced together. Learn to read the movements of the universe in its smallest artifacts, like tea leaves or the flight of birds or the spots on birds' livers. Or learn to use those little spells and rituals that will move the universe. Perfect sense, you know. It's it, it was logical to them. Yeah. They did and not. If it works, it yeah, works, right? It works, right. They didn't <laughs> That's think they the were argument. They did not think they were consorting with demons or any such thing. They did not equate magic with demonism or Satanism. And and actually, rarely are they exactly the same thing, at least from from their point of view. Magicians generally do not claim to be consort, consorting with Satan until you get to the Renaissance when it's, yeah, think Dr. Faustus and all that. Uh, and then there were the mystery cults. These were revivals, renewals, and ramped up versions of the dying and rising God that goes back into ancient history. You can think of of Horus and Tammuz and Adonis and Proserpina or Persephone. Uh, the world has since Babel known many gods who die and rise again. And the secular world has been fond of saying, see, Christianity is just copying that. No, <laughs> because these, insofar as, as we're even sure that there is historical precedent and they weren't made up after Christianity was on the scene, and uh, Lutheran satire has one on, <laughs> or a couple of things you can check out. Yeah. One on Horus and one on Easter. I forget exactly what they have. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's, there, there are historical questions as to what actually happened. When, but even if they are ancient, these dying gods died because the universe got them. And yet somehow they managed to come back through some kind of supernatural power and they rose to become gods. And they did not do it for us. And there's no, there's no notion here of sin or guilt or substitutionary atonement. There is just the will to live, the power, the, the recognizing the divinity imminent in oneself so that you transcend the, the transcendentalists would have understand them, understood this really well. They just didn't need a dying rising God to pull it off. They just looked <laughs> to their own hearts. And that's kind of the thing. This God has shown us it's possible. He's a way shower. He's a leader. He's trod the road ahead of us, but he's not strictly speaking a savior. And he certainly isn't dealing with sin. What's that anyhow? There's no creator God. There's no such thing as sin. There's just this mean universe that's out to get us. And the dying and rising God uh, shows us what's possible. And these mystery cults were wrapped up in secrets and levels of initiates not unlike Freemasonry and mm -hmm. um, the Illuminati and other such groups where you work your way up through stages of knowledge and magical secrets and occult revelations and all this. And at some point you might, with a little help from uh, your friends, you might have a nice drug experience of seeing the face of a God and come away saying, wow, that's so great. I want to be just like him someday. It, it, it was hope in a world that had no hope. Uh, so these are some of the things that people turn to. Oh, there is one more. Some people found their escape in utopian fiction. They read fantasy literature <laughs> about other worlds and other places that were more exciting than theirs. And although that's not the purpose of Narnia or Middle Earth, they at least will give you an idea of what these people were wanting. They wanted a better world, and if they could only live in their books and imagine being there and not here. Hey, 
It's better than the alternative and safer than drugs. So these are some of the things that the ancient world was experiencing when the gospel broke loose and had to tell people, challenge people, uh, there's a real God who holds you really accountable for your actions and the ways you're trying to get to him or escape him do not work. Let us tell you about the true Lagos. Let us tell you about the true word of God, the word of the Father, the, the God who actually did come for our sins out of love and die and rise again to meet uh, the demands, the ethical demands of a just and holy God. So Christianity had to redefine the intellectual landscape even as it preached Christ. Because each of these systems could take Christ and incorporate him into the system as long as they denied the most basic truths about him, which is still true today. It's what the cults always do. We will, we will take Christ. We will use the name. We'll use a few images, uh, literary images, a, a few of his, we'll speak of death and resurrection and God's love, but we will so redefine it that it's no longer Christianity. And when Christians attack us, we will say things like, well, that's just your interpretation. And that's an old uh, ethnocentric, European-centric interpretation. The Bible had other things in mind. You're so narrow-minded. And on, on it goes. There are a couple of things I guess we should say. We haven't, we haven't already said them already. Pax Romana. With the defeat of Anthony and Cleopatra, or rather with her suicides, Egypt fell into Augustus' hands, or Octavian's hands. He declared more or less Roman Empire. At least he declared himself to be the august one, the godlike one. And although he never took the title emperor, that's in effect what the, 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 the remnants of the old republic now became. And yes, for those of you out there who never made the connection, <laughs> the political system of Star Wars is modeled on Roman history from the Senate <laughs> to the collapse of the Senate to the, the emperor all of that, the, the days of the old republic defended by, yeah. Um, nothing new under the sun. Nothing new and under the sun. And also the stories that God tells in history are pretty compelling. So when <laughs> we try to write our own, that's kind of, <laughs> yeah, creating, there's easy source material. Yeah, th those sci-fi writers or fantasy writers who've tried to construct an entire universe from scratch generally fail miserably. It Even Tolkien didn't do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> neither did Lewis exactly. He just borrowed all kinds of things from all kinds of directions without any coherence, and people have never <laughs> forgiven him for that. I don't and know. And that's I, why we love him. <laughs> I, I like Narnia anyway. Uh, uh, a question back on uh, Roman history is, yeah. so um, Octavian is the one that starts the trend of calling the rulers Caesars? Is that correct? Well, because we had Julius Caesar, yeah. but Caesar was his name. Right. Oh, I right. see what you're saying. Versus yeah. in yeah. the future, everybody will become Caesar this, Caesar that. So that, is it because Octavian was related to Julius Caesar and wanted to keep that alive? Or how did, how did that work? Um, I cannot speak with authority here because okay. I've never heard that question before. Not no. that it isn't an obvious one. Uh, but I obviously Octavian was, uh, he was the adopted heir of Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. And people after his death, literally worshipped Julius Caesar, despite mm -hmm. the assassination and all of that. When it was over and said Julius was elevated to the role of godhood, when Augustus came to the throne, yes, keeping the name ensured a continuity of trust and belief. Um, Virgil comes along and writes the Aeneid as one grand celebration of Rome's great role in universal salvation or redemption. Uh, there was, uh, when... Um, Augustus took the throne. There was a star that appeared in the sky, and Rome declared an Advent celebration because obviously he was the Savior come to turn around history, uh, and was celebrated by Virgil. So, which is why I, when I was growing up, every time I encountered the word Virgil, it was spelled V-I. It was only much, much later, probably in college, that I began to see it spelled V-E. And I wondered about this because I'd seen it everywhere. Not not Christian books particularly, but any book. Always spelled Virgil, V-I-R. Finally, I found out what was going on. Virgil had made some prophecies written not too far in advance of this universal savior who would come 
and change the world. And when Augustus is revealed as this great emperor who is, although he never used that word, pulling everything together and bringing world peace, that looked pretty good. And until he was upstaged by Jesus. <laughs> and people looked at Jesus as, oh, that's what Virgil was really getting at. So rather than spelling his name V-E-R-G, we will spell it V-I-R-G because he foresaw the virgin-born Savior and wrote about him in what? his wonderful prophecies. What? <laughs> so <laughs> They spelled Virgil so it looked like virgin. Not that's because that's dumb. how he actually spelled... Well, <laughs> You're so weird. judgmental here. <laughs> it's just I mean, such an odd thing to fixate on. A you, yeah, a game you, writer. You just <laughs> you, you can't just change people's names like that. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Think about how the Greeks changed everybody's name, and the Romans came along and changed the Greeks' name to Greek. Uh, if you're in control, you can name people anything you want, and I assume as we go. Oh, here's one for you, just throwing this one out. The proper name of Constantinople, oddly enough, was Constantinople. Byzantium was its Greek name when it was a little Greek settlement before Constantine enlarged it and made it his second capital, and from then on its name was Constantinople. It was later historians who went back and said... Yeah, that smacks of a new Roman of Constantine. We don't want that. Let's go back and use this Greek name. And we'll call it the Byzantine Empire. It was not called, it was called the Roman Empire because Constantinople was the second Rome. Mm -hmm. And then you run into those people who say, by the way, did you know that Rome never fell? It's still there. This is all a conspiracy of historians to rewrite things and snatch away Rome's glory. Anyway, that's not <laughs> Um, So we got as far as the Pax Romana. So... For the next long time, briefly disrupted around AD 70, oddly enough, but then restored, the world knows peace. At the very time that Jesus enters it and that the gospel missionaries need to go out and reach the four corners of the empire before AD 70, peace falls on the world. One of those very rare times in the history of the world. Someone's done the calculations based on our knowledge of history to try to figure out how many times wars have actually ceased in the world. And apparently, this is one of the few. Yeah, um, I don't and, think there are a lot. <laughs> no, they're not. And uh, with that, the uh, the Persians had built great roads uh, so that their post riders moved along them quickly so that neither, what, rain nor snow nor sleet nor damage, <laughs> all of that. Um, but the Romans picked up on, on the Persian roads and improved them and then added their own into Northern Europe so that you could go very quickly. They kept the seas free from pirates. You could travel just about anywhere. Couldn't do anything about storms, as Paul found out more than once. <laughs> but at least as far as uh, as bad guys, the oceans were relatively free. Nations were not fighting. And Romans courts administered justice with a more or less equal hand. That doesn't mean they were always right or just or nice about it. And they didn't necessarily like their conquered peoples. But they tried not to favor one group above another because they want to maintain a peace and order. Uh, and it's into the, and oh, and with the roads come post writers, what we call post office, uh, FedEx. For those of you who don't know that the post office used to deliver letters when people actually wrote them. Uh, <laughs> in those days, you could send a message from one city to another and it would actually get there and fairly promptly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fun fact, FedEx mm -hmm. and UPS are heavily regulated. So if you're thinking they're the free market alternatives <laughs> to the post office, you are incorrect. Oh, yeah. Well, there was a long time when um, any, I, I don't know if it still holds, but only the post office could deliver letters by mm. federal law. <laughs> yeah. So if you wanted to send letters, you had to attach them by FedEx, you had to attach them somehow to the packet, and it gets complicated. Even if you <laughs> yeah. wanted to send letters to the post office, you have to it, tell people up front, yeah, and there's a letter here. Oh, well, that's extra for the letter. Right, because yeah. media mail is... Yeah. That's, yeah. See, my family gets around that by writing notes in the book. <laughs> ah, there you go. That works. They haven't thought of that one yet, because they don't know Bibliophiles nearly well enough. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so this is the world into which Jesus came. It was a world in despair. It was a world that was frustrated. It was a world that had no conception of truth. But it was a world that was outwardly at peace 
with wonderful roads, a good postal system, people could travel in safety, and you probably would be relatively protected as you journeyed from one province to another. And you can think of the times when Paul was actually rescued by the Roman government, or at least not executed out of hand just because someone said it was a good idea. Um, this is what's going on. And as we look at the prophecies of Daniel, Daniel, in describing the fourth great world empire, uh, in Daniel 2, the image of the humanoid statue, Rome is iron. It, it's not gold, it's not silver, it's not even brass. It's it, What do you do with iron? You hit things and break them. That's pretty <laughs> much it. It's tough, it's strong, and um, takes a lot to bring it down. In Daniel 7, when the same ideas are presented as beasts out of the ocean, out of the Gentile Sea, Rome is a beast like no other, a diverse beast. And again, we're with the iron nails and the iron teeth stamping and and having its own unique way. It's not even, the, the first beast is like a lion, the next like a bear, the next like a leopard. But Rome is not, can't be categorized. It's something brand new because it doesn't play by the rules. It makes the rules up as it goes and maintains peace, not in terms of the Assyrian Babylonian idea of Babel, but simply by, we're here, we got the power, we're making this work. Shut up. Do what you're told. Um, no high philosophical goals. I mean, Aeneas sta or, uh, Virgil stated them in the Aeneid, but people didn't go around praising the westward course of empire and Rome as the new Messiah. They said it of, of Augustus, but after that, yeah, the Caesars claimed to be gods, and that didn't go well because these Caesars were horrible, wicked men, and now everybody, everybody knew that. It's just, at this point, paganism is in its last gasp, we're at the end of an age, and we need a savior, both in both culturally, politically, but most importantly, for man's deepest needs, for the salvation of soul and body from sin and its consequences. And that's, I assume, where we pick up next time. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Uh, so let's wrap up with some recommendations. <laughs> uh, do you uh, have any recommendations, we'll do, Gretchen? Yeah. Gretchen, let's, what would you like us to recommend? Do you have any recommendations? Do you have a favorite show? Yes. What's your favorite show? Um, the Muppets. The Muppets. Okay. I, I am, I am solidly <laughs> behind this. The Muppet um, Show is a great recommendation. Uh, when our girls were small. It was one of the few things that we did show them, although there was one season we avoided <laughs> because of some of the uh, <clears throat> female types who showed up. Ah. Uh, but <laughs> some, yeah, it's an, it's not a kid's show as a as a concept. Yeah. <laughs> it's but a variety show that it's happens a to have it's puppets. A, it's a, it's, yeah. No, Muppets, they're not the same thing, obviously. It's true. It's true. Um, <laughs> I was going to say something, I don't know what it was. Moving on, Rachel, do you have anything? Yes, I'm going to go back to one of the podcasts that I enjoyed, uh, which is from Alicia Childers again. Uh, but this mm -hmm. one is uh, her speaking with um, a mom who is also a writer and various other things um, on the question of should Christians practice gentle parenting? Oh, I'm going to be very controversial <laughs> and recommend this because their answer is going to be no. <laughs> Good. Um, but I appreciated it because the um, lady that she speaks with, whose name I'm going to look up right now. Uh, so she speaks with Abby Halbertstadt, I think is how you say it. She's known on the internet as M is for Mama, uh, but she has 10 kids. Uh, and so she claims oh, she has the practical the laboratory of... What's that? The book M is for Mama? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. that's her. I read that's that. her persona. That's yes. Um, she has another one that's also is bad the same or is hard the same as bad. Hard is uh, not the same thing as bad. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't read that one, but I've heard good yeah, things. Yeah, I, I started that one. But this one she takes on and she's been in a lot of the parenting blogs and things. So she's seen a lot of the outgrowth of gentle parenting. And I particularly appreciate the story that she tells where one parent comes on a blog and says, um, it's Easter and I don't know how to explain uh, Jesus' death to my child because I've made it clear to them that there should never be punishment for doing wrong. And I don't know how to oh tell them about <laughs> Jesus being punished by God. And then she also describes some of the 
horrendous answers that people gave, which basically created a whole false gospel um, Mm. that reinterpreted the whole atonement. So it it has a lot of really good points, um, just practically, but also theologically. Mm. Excellent. Well, I'm going to be far more bland and less controversial and say Will and Ariel (laughs) Durant's Christ and Caesar, or Caesar and Christ, I forget which order they do it in. Uh, again, the Durants write popularly, and I have seen them receive flack from professional historians for not being, well, professional historians, whatever that means. <laughs> they write history books and make money off of them. How is that not professional? How dare they? You it's know. like popular history, like David McCullough, how dare? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> how dare you tell a story that people find compelling and, and readable? Make, and make money off of <laughs> it because we, we've been yeah. writing books for years and it, they don't sell like this. So, you know, right. so something wrong with you. <laughs> um, the, the Durant's books are thick, but they're easy to read. And uh, if you can stay with the book for a long time, but you can always put it down, pick it up later. Uh, and uh, they're not Christians. But for background history, for... And they generally uh, shrink some paragraphs that aren't as important. So you can skip those if you don't want to know all the details. But at some place, we got it. We have to start reading histories. And here is something that's very accessible for most people. There are probably better books, but one that spans such a wide range of time, very self-consciously knowing that the issue here is between Jesus and Caesar. It's, it's, it's a good starting point. There are other books that are more controversial you could follow. And of course, there's always um, R.J. Rush Juni's Foundations of Social Order, where he tackles the theological issues that were involved. And as we go further along, I'm sure we will have other recommendations. Assuming the coming children allow us to keep going, <laughs> we will see we how that will. works as the we time goes. We will do goes. our best, yes. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. A big thank you also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. A big thank you to our financial supporters who keep the show rolling. Um, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our Patreon. It's Patriot. Pa- Patriot. No. Patreon. Like patron with an E in the middle. <laughs> Patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. And if you'd like to send us an email, we would love to hear from you. The way to get in touch with us is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.